Hello and welcome to North Shore Fellowship's online service. We are glad that you are here and it is truly our prayer that you receive every blessing that God has prepared for you during this time. So do away with any distractions and settle in and get ready to receive what God has. If you would, click the share button on your Facebook feed or send the link to some friends so that they can join in as well and receive in these blessings too. Let's pray together. Father, we do ask that every single blessing that has been prepared for your people through this service, that we are able to receive it. We ask that you protect us from distractions during this time, and that you give us open hearts and open minds. Father, help us to worship truly, help us to listen well, and help us to receive from your Spirit what you have for us. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together.
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near. I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. And if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh no, never let go through the coming I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on A glorious light beyond all compare And there will be an end to these struggles But until that day comes We'll live to know you here on the earth <laughs> I will fear no evil For my God is with to be with you as always. Well, this may have been a very unusual Christmas for some of us, but uh, I pray that you are all able to enjoy it. have just a few things that I want you to be aware of. We do have some changes to our small group schedules through the week because of the holidays. The men's group, which typically meet on Thursday evening, and the prayer group that typically meets on Monday evening. We'll not be doing so this week, but we'll pick up again right after the first of the year. I remind you that we have groups that meet throughout the week for men, for women, for married couples, and for youth. So it's a great way to reach out and to get connected. Hey, did you also remember that we have a radio show that Pastor Raphael does on the weekend on Bridge FM? Another great way that you can listen and that you can share with others. Of course, we have all of our online facilities for you, the website, the Facebook page, the YouTube channel, 
plenty of things that you can watch and plenty of things that you can share with others. Remind you too that we're in the middle of the winter season as we've seen with the bad weather that we've just gone through. Um, if things change and they might, we will post them on all those different sources as quickly as we can. But the best thing is for you to indeed just pay attention to those and to watch them closely. We will of course be using email. So if you're not on our email list, boy, we'd love to get you on there. It's the best way to get information directly to you. If you aren't, just send your request to info at northshorenj.com. Org. Well, throughout the week, Wednesday, we have Worship in the Word, 7 p.m. on Facebook Live with Pastor Raphael and Allie, a wonderful midweek study that you can come enjoy and interact with since it's Facebook Live. On Sunday, of course, we have our in-person services at 9 a.m. We're in the Peninsula facility, and at 11 a.m. we're in Bell Works. Now, both of those facilities do have children's ministry available. For online on Sunday at 9 and 10.30, we premiere on Facebook and YouTube. And for online for the kids at 11, we have that Zoom call. So, hey, as 2020 draws to a close, allow me to wish you all a healthy and happy new year. Thank you so very much. May God bless you all. Friends, as we're coming to the end of 2020, I want to thank you, especially those who are giving and tithing faithfully to North Shore Fellowship. I know it's tough times. It's been tough for us. It's been tough for you. It's been tough for the church. It's been a challenge, but God has brought us through. And God's provided, particularly of those of us who believe in this mission and are giving faithfully and tithing regularly. I want to encourage you to continue that into the new year. There's so many great things that I believe God has for us and he'll do it all, but he'll use us to facilitate the resources that we need. I also want to ask this, if you would consider giving an end of the year tax deductible gift. I know that some of you are not in a position to do that, but some are. And if you are, I truly believe that the mission God's given us is a worthwhile and a valuable mission. It's exactly what the world needs. It's exactly what our area needs to worship, for evangelism, for ministry to children, for encouragement, for meeting the needs of the poor among us. And I, my prayer is that you, as well as the rest of us, will partner together and see great things in the area that God's chosen us to live. Thank you. Please join me in prayer. Dear Father God, we come before you, and Father, we thank you. We thank you for the many blessings that you give. We thank you for the provision that you so graciously pour out upon us. Father, we ask that you would take this portion back, that you would purpose it, that you would direct it, and that you would use it as you see fit. Father, direct all of our ways and just help us to do the things that you would have us to do. Father, we thank you and praise you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Let's direct our hearts to the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for how you have provided for us this year. There have been so many challenges, unprecedented challenges, unprecedented adversity, yet you have taken us through. And now we are here at the threshold of a brand new year. And we say thank you for that. But we also pray, God, for the things that exist in this world that affect us so deeply. Everything from the political environment, the pandemic, uh, the economy, and the many things, Lord, that have been very rough for us this year. You've brought us through, but we do continually ask for your help. We pray for peace in the world. We pray for the end of the pandemic. And we also pray, God, that we can be lights in a dark place. I pray that you'll cause your church, those who call upon your name, to rise up and be the light of the world, no matter how dark it gets. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord, we also pray for those who are struggling, those who are sick that need your healing. Lord, we do pray, God, that you would just give them your healing touch. We pray for those that are struggling with the COVID situation, with the, um, their, their finances and, and jobs. And Lord, we do pray, God, that you would be their provision. And we are asking, Lord, every week we pray, God, that you would just use us to be peacemakers in this divided world in our country, Lord. We love you and we trust you and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you need prayer for anything, please reach out to us. You can email us at prayer at northshorenj.org. Well, we just passed through the Christmas season, which is the most celebrated time of the year on the Christian calendar. And it's really important because it's so significant about the birth of Jesus and all the things that took place before, during, and immediately after his birth. And I came up with a message years ago that I just kind of uh, made new and improved for you this year. It's called the 12 Days of Christmas, but now it's called the 12 Days of Christmas and Beyond. And I want you to pay attention. There are 12 days, 12 things that happened before, during, and after Jesus' birth. And one in particular that I want to pay careful attention to 
and that will come in at number 12. So bear with me as we go through some of the things that we've been already talking about this month, 12 significant days, and they obviously include the significant people. Now, the first one that we looked at is Gabriel, Gabriel that breaks the 400 years of silence. In Luke 1.13, it says, the angel Gabriel said to him, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you'll call him John. The reason that's so important is that that day was the first glimpse of light in the 400 years of darkness, of hopelessness. They call it the 400 years of silence. I call it the 400 years of violence because the people in Jerusalem, the people of Judea and beyond were being oppressed and kingdom after kingdom was oppressing them and conquering them. And even their own priests and prophets were offering no hope until this happened. Gabriel speaks. He speaks to high priest Zechariah and says, you will bear a son even in your old age. And it's a, he will be a very, very special person because of who he represents. And we'll get back to him a little bit later. That was Gabriel speaking to Zechariah as the number one of the 12 important days of Christmas. Next is the Annunciation. Same angel, Gabriel, but this time he goes up to Nazareth and he announces to Mary that she will bear a son. And he, well, it says in Luke 1, 30 to 32, the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and be called the son of the most high. Now this, we call this the Annunciation. In fact, if you go to Nazareth, it's this village that's still there today, and you go uh, to the area where they believe that this took place, where Gabriel visited, there's actually a gigantic church called the Basilica of the Annunciation. It's said to be the largest Christian church in all of the Middle East. And it's there, what they say is on the likely spot where Mary would have lived and where Mary would have received uh, this incredible message that not only would she bear the son, but that God would be the father, that he would be fathered by the Holy Spirit. So let's make that number two. Now, bear in mind, these are not in order of importance, uh, but in order of appearance. Number three would be when Mary visits her cousin, Elizabeth, who is a relative of hers, down in Judea, down near Jerusalem. So she had to travel south, similar to where she would be traveling when she's pregnant, uh, with Joseph going to Bethlehem, but slightly different tale at the end where they went to Ancarum as opposed to Bethlehem. But this visit is really important, and it happens in Luke 1, 41 through 42. And here's why. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And with a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you bear. You see, Elizabeth's baby also leaped in her womb. John the Baptist leaped in his, in his mother's womb just at the presence of pregnant Mary. Mary pregnant with Jesus entering in the room. And why is this so important? Is because of the presence of the Holy Spirit filling these people were first filling John the Baptist while he's still a baby. And then his mother Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. It says in verse 41 of Luke 1. And then in verse 42, she says, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you bear. You see, both John and Elizabeth were filled with the Holy Spirit on that day, which is number three in our 12 days of Christmas. Number four is when the angel speaks to Joseph in a dream. And that's kind of how the angel spoke to Joseph when he needed to tell him something. And this is in Matthew 1, 21, uh, 20 and 21. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now bear in mind, Mary had told Joseph, I'm pregnant. Joseph I can't imagine the emotion he felt. His reaction, however, was to divorce her quietly, not to put her to public shame, of which it would have been very severe, and to just kind of maybe go on with his life. However, this angel, this day, day four, an angel interrupted him, confirmed the things that Mary had told him, and said, don't be afraid, because the child that she bears is conceived by the Holy Spirit, and you are to name him Jesus. You're to name him Jesus. And 
is interesting because we could do a whole study of the word Jesus, the name Jesus. It wasn't an uncommon name. It was a name that was possibly even one of his disciples uh, had a name close to Jesus as well. But Jesus means salvation. And it's a derivative of Joshua, you know, Hoshua or Yeshua, which means salvation. Yehoshua means the Lord is our salvation. So it's a derivative of this word. And we would say the transliteration from uh, uh, English to Hebrew would be Yeshua. That's why in Messianic circles, they usually call Jesus Yeshua. Yeshua, that's his name. And remember what it means. It means salvation. And this is uh, the angel telling Joseph, don't be afraid. Name that boy Mary. He's conceived, I mean, name Mary's son Joseph. He's conceived by the Holy Spirit. And he moves on. So that's number four. And number five of the 12 days of Christmas it's when John the Baptist is born. John the Baptist is born, probably six months or so before Jesus is born. And the reason his birth and his life was so important is because of what he signifies. This is one of the most significant moments of ushering in the Messiah is when John the Baptist is born because his life, the purpose of that man's life was to make way for the Messiah, to prepare the way of the Lord. And his life was prophesied about 700 years ago before he was born by Isaiah. Now, it wasn't just Jesus who Isaiah was prophesying about, but in this case, what we're about to read, Isaiah was prophesying about John the Baptist who would prepare the way of the Lord. And we read this in two places, in Mark 1 and then also in Isaiah 40. Mark 1 is quoting Isaiah 40. In fact, the Gospel of Mark starts out quoting Isaiah 40 about John the Baptist. That's how John Mark started his Gospel. And here's what it is, Mark 1, 1 through 3. The beginning of good news about Jesus, Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. And this is about John the Baptist. Now also, the Jews were waiting for a sign, the sign of Elijah, because the last verses of the Old Testament said, watch out for Elijah, he will come just before the great day of the Lord. Uh, and what does John the Baptist have to do with Elijah? Well, according to the angel, according to the prophecy, everything. In verse, in verse uh, 17 of Luke 1, it says, he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Jesus even confirmed that John the Baptist was the incarnate uh, representation of Elijah the prophet. Now he is the one who came and made straight the paths of the Lord, prepared for the Lord. In fact, for the Messiah to come, this man needed to come first. That's why number five in our 12 days of Christmas, John the Baptist being born is a very significant one. Number six is the day that the census was decreed. Why the day the census was decreed as one of the 12 days of Christmas? Uh, it had some purpose to it. Now we read about this in Luke 2, 1 through 5. And let's just read this through. In the days, those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was the governor of Syria. And everyone went on to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee in Judea, uh, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged, he was pledged to be married to and was expecting a child. Okay, the census. Caesar Augustus, he was the Caesar that was in charge, the Roman emperor that was in charge of everything. You know, he had other people in places uh, running different parts of his kingdom, the empire for him. But Caesar Augustus, when he issues a decree, those leaders, those local leaders, they have to carry it out. Now, this took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now, who's Quirinius and what does Syria have to do with anything? Caesar Augustus was the Caesar between 63 BC and 14 AD. So a lot of the time just before Jesus and some of the time of Jesus' childhood, uh, Caesar Augustus was the one. Now, you know about Herod. Herod the Great was the, the Tetrarch. He was the, 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 kingdom, the, the ruler of the kingdom of the Jews. He kind of ruled the Jewish areas. 
He made them pay heavy taxes to Caesar. He ruled them with an iron fist. He, he brutally murdered anyone who disagreed with him or threatened him in any way. He was terrible. However, he died when Jesus was about three or four years old, and he re was replaced by his son Archelaus, who was even worse. He was even more cruel, more brutal. He was so brutal that Caesar Augustus says, you got to get that guy out of here, and they banished Herod Archelaus. So who's going to run the show? Well, they, the next door neighbor, <laughs> the, the country next door, Quirinius of Syria, he was apparently covering at least the census part of the empire at this point. At this point. So Quirinius was the governor of Syria. I suppose he was in charge of his neighboring region to make sure the census happened. And now why is the census important? It did two things. There was a dilemma. As we look back, Matthew tells us that Jesus will be called a Nazarene. But we read in other places that Jesus must be born in Bethlehem. So the Micah prophecy and, the, and Matthew's uh, reference to a prophecy seem to be in contention. They seem to they contradict one another. Is he from Bethlehem or is he from Nazarene? Nazareth? Nazareth. Is he a Nazarene? Both. Both could be true because he, his family was from living in Nazareth. Their ancestral heritage is in Bethlehem. Because of that census, they needed to come from Nazareth temporarily live in Bethlehem until they could be counted and then go back to Nazareth. So Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but he was called and known as Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, you could read about Bethlehem in a great blog by our own Sean Blythe. So if you go to our site, northshorenj.org, and click on blog, there's a wonderful uh, explanation story about Bethlehem with a lot of facts and details during this time. So the census gets these the Holy Family, we call them, Jesus and Mary, uh, Joseph and Mary and Jesus on the way into Bethlehem. And then number seven, the perfect number seven, is when the greatest of the 12 days of Christmas takes place. Number seven is the birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus. And what's interesting about this is that even though this is the most important event in the history of mankind, <laughs> It's really only given half a verse. It's given half a verse. It's in Luke 2, 7, uh, the first part. <laughs> and it's just so keeping with his, the humble nature of his birth and of, really of his life and death as well, that it says this in Luke 2, 7, A, and she gave birth to her first son, firstborn a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger uh, because there was no room at the end. But basically, that first half says, she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger. And that was it. The greatest moment of history up to that point when the word became flesh, when God took on flesh and became a man, when Jesus was born and lived among us. So amazing. And it happened in what's probably a cave or an empty grotto, probably not a very neat and ornate stable, um, you know, like we see in some of our nativities. Uh, this was just a place where sometimes they keep the animals. At least this night they probably weren't because at least the sheep were out in the field with the shepherds. Um, so there was a feeding trough wherever they ended up. They didn't find any room in the inn. It's important to know though that uh, we don't know much about the inn. Was it a house? Was it one of their rel distant relatives' houses? Um, there's no innkeeper mentioned, although he seems to be prominent in a lot of the Christmas plays and Christmas movies. There's really no innkeeper specifically mentioned. But wherever they ended up to have this baby, there was a feeding trough. Now, if you go to Israel today, um, likely they'll ask you if you want to go to Bethlehem. And they think they found the spot. They think they found the place in the, the little town of Bethlehem where this feeding trough may have been and they've made not just one church, but three churches. Three churches are built upon it. They're all kind of fighting for space. Uh, how could that be? Well, underneath is the tunnel, which is called the grotto, and in the middle of it all, there's a star on the floor, and they say, that's where Jesus was born. Who am I to argue? I will say, though, that there's, they're just sort of mongering amongst this place. There's a lot of trinkets being sold and souvenirs 
a lot going on. You have to, it's in the uh, West Bank, so you have to go kind of past the, the checkpoint to get there. You can't have an Israeli tour guide. You have to switch to a Palestinian tour guide. And once you get there, um, there's a lot of rules, regulations, and there's a lot of stress. And there's a lot of like really gaudy Christmas ornaments hanging. It's a real Christmassy type of thing. But the most gaudy lame and gold and old dusty sparkly Christmas ornaments, you can tell I'm not really particularly fond of it. I often think about how tacky it is. Sometimes I even say, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, this is tacky. <laughs> but Jesus, Mary and Joseph are clearly the star of the show here. Mary, Joseph and Jesus in this, at least this town and very likely that spot or that area is where it happened, where Jesus came into the world and here he was with Mary and Joseph. Now, number eight, in the 12 days of Christmas. Number eight is when the angels said to the shep- uh, came to the shepherds and showed who he, Jesus was, told who he really was. And this is in Luke 2, 8 through 14. And here's what it says. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. Now listen to these, this phrase, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a multitude of angels of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill to men. Wow. This is really important. Now, it's not a separate day uh, than the day that Jesus was born. It's very likely the same night, that silent night, that holy night. But it's a separate incident. It happened, you know, maybe a few miles away. But the thing that the angel said is of incredible significance. Obviously, he first says, do not be afraid because angels are scary. As soon as they show up, they scare people half to death and they have to say, do not be afraid. And then they go on. First, it was one angel and then eventually a multitude. And, and this one angel was the one with the message. And he said, I, bring, I give you great joy. I bring you good news of great joy. For today in the town of David, a savior is born. Now the city of David or the town of David uh, is Bethlehem. It's a little confusing now. Um, Bethlehem is the town of David or the city of David because that's where David was born. But there is a place called the city of David, which is right next to the old city of Jerusalem. And that's where David lived when he was king of of uh, Israel. So do, those are sometimes confusing. But here's where, what I want you to look at. The angel's statement next. And that's when he said in verse 11, there's born to you this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That is as important as it can possibly be. Christ meaning Messiah, the long-awaited anointed one, the one whom everyone had been waiting for for hundreds and hundreds and thousands, really, of years. Moses even wrote of him, that the Messiah would come, the anointed one, the Holy One of Israel, the one whom God would send. That's who they were saying this person is. Christ and Messiah are the same word. But he also says it's Christ the Lord. Well, what is Lord? Adonai. Adonai, Kyrios, Lord is, the, is who they call God. I mean, really, there's more, uh, probably more prayers in the Hebrew faith that use the word Adonai than any other name of God because he is the most holy one, the one, the, God, the, the Lord of all. And that's who the angel said had just been born. <laughs> Can you imagine that? You're a shepherd out in the field and someone, an angel comes up to you, scares you to death and says, hey, it's, I have good news. The Messiah, the Lord of all, has just been born to you and he's wrapped in swaddling clothes and he's lying in a manger just a few miles away. That was the message. And then, now listen, the the multitude of angels come and they are rejoicing, greatly rejoicing. They're all excited. Why are they so excited? They're so excited that they're saying, glory to God in the highest. You know, peace to his people on earth. Goodwill to men. Glory to God in the highest. You know, Gloria in excelsis Deo. They're celebrating, almost like a gigantic cheering section. 
because Mary gave birth to a baby and wrapped this baby in strips of cloth and laid this baby in a feeding trough. What is so exciting about that? <laughs> they saw something that perhaps others didn't see, and we're going to get to that. So hang on to that thought. Number nine, the 12 days of Christmas. Important days. When Jesus was presented at the temple on the eighth day after his birth. Number, the ninth day is the eighth day. Number, the ninth 12th of the 12 days is the eighth day when Jesus is presented at the temple. Really important for a number of reasons. Three I could think of right off the bat. Well, it says in Luke 2, 21, on the eighth day when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Now, just think about what we just read. That's when he was given the name Jesus. Also, there's two people he met on that day or around that day, and they are Simeon and Anna. Simeon, a devout man, we've talked about him, who was told by the Holy Spirit, old man, you will not die until you see the Messiah, the Lord's anointed. And there he was when, they, when Joseph and Mary brought this baby, he held him in his arms and he praised God and said, now your servant can die in peace. And then there was Anna, the prophetess, who also acknowledged that this is the redeemer of Israel. This prophetess, this old woman, over 100 years old, acknowledged that this baby was exactly who she had hoped he would be. And then he was given the name Jesus. We talked about the name already, but that was when he was officially or formally named. On that eighth day, as he's circumcised and consecrated before the Lord. What was his name before then? Who knows? Maybe they called him Jesus. Maybe they just called him Emmanuel. God is with us and kept the formal name for his bris. Number 10, the Magi visit the Messiah. I love this story. I've talked about it recently. The Magi, the wise men from the east, they come. In Matthew 2, 1 and 2, it says this. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we've seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Obviously, a caravan of wise guys, wise men who came from a very far distance. They got a tip about the star somewhere. They heard some prophecy. They came bearing great gifts, great wealth. And they came and initially they stopped at Herod's and they said to King Herod, you know, we're here to worship the king. Where is he? And Herod said, well, um, you know, let's call the wise men together. And they said, oh, the, the prophecy is that he'll be born in Bethlehem, five miles away. So they, Herod said, go and worship him and then come back and tell me how it went and I'll go worship him too. And so they went, um, but they knew Herod, they were tipped off that Herod was disingenuous. So they gave Jesus the, this incredible array of gifts, expensive gifts, gold, frankincense, myrrh, and then they went home another way and they didn't tell Herod about where they found him. Now, these gifts, as we spoke about in a recent sermon, was, a, was an immense amount of wealth. And immediately after these wise men worshipped Jesus, affirmed that the star hanging over Jesus' house truly indicated where the king of the Jews was, they left. They went home another way. They left their treasures with Jesus. And Joseph was told by God, you've got to get out of there and move to Egypt. And so they had enough provision to move, temporarily move to Egypt and then back way up north to Nazareth. And they didn't go, as far as we know, did not go back to Bethlehem. And the reason he had to move to Egypt was because of what was about to take place. And this is number 11 of the 12 days of Christmas. It's the massacre of the holy innocents in Matthew 2.16. It's probably one of the saddest things of the whole Christmas story. It's really horrific. Matthew 2.16, Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which had been determined by the wise men. Wow. Herod was furious about being outwitted 
by these wise men. And he was so paranoid that there would be another leader that would take his spot that he did the most unthinkable thing, most inhumane thing that you can imagine and had all the young babies, toddlers and down, two years old and down, murdered that were male babies in, in the town of Bethlehem. That fulfilled actually a prophecy, however, in Jeremiah 31, 15, talks about Rachel weeping for her children. Rachel, as you know, is, is the only patriarch or patriarch's wife that is buried in Bethlehem. The rest are in Hebron. So she's associated with Bethlehem, weeping for children. And those are the 11 days of Christmas. And there's one more, the 12th day of Christmas. <laughs> the 12th important day of Christmas. Can you guess what it is? Take a guess. What do you think it is? Now remember, it's an order of appearance, so you know it's kind of following some chronological cycle. Well, if you give up, let me tell you exactly what it is. Are you listening? Here we go. The 12th day of Christmas is the day that an enormous red seven-headed dragon with ten horns was hurled down to earth. That's right. The 12th day of Christmas was when an enormous red seven-headed dragon with ten horns was hurled down to earth. And that needs no explanation. So Merry Christmas. I hope you have a wonderful new year. And we'll end it right there. No, it needs, it needs some explanation, doesn't it? <laughs> an enormous ten red-headed enormous red seven-headed dragon with ten horns was hurled down to earth? What does that have to do with Christmas? Well, let's look at it. We find this in Revelation 12, the first ten verses, and we'll read this. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in the heavens. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven, and the dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray, he was hurled to earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> now, clearly, this is a vision of revelation, and it has something to do with the birth of Jesus. Now, listen, this is in the spirit world. That's what John is seeing when he's writing this. So it doesn't always match up to the same chronology of time on earth, but sometimes they intersect the, where eternity and chronology intersect. And this is one of them, when Jesus was born when Jesus was born. Now this passage gives a glimpse of what was really happening in the heavenlies the moment Jesus was born. He's lying in a humble manger. It's a silent night. It's a holy night on a midnight clear. And we're, you know, we're never aware of what's going on in the heavenlies like Jesus is, like God is, or like the angels are. And that's why the angels were cheering. Yes, they saw Mary, they saw the swaddling clothes, they saw the feeding trough, but they also got a glimpse of what we just read the beginning of this war in the heavens where the devil is being cast down, where God is overcome. And it said what we just read. Now have come salvation and power, the kingdom of our God, the authority of his Messiah. Wow. In the natural, Joseph and Mary are probably looking around and they're saying, wow, we are forced into very humble accommodations. Uh, we're enduring very difficult circumstances. We're being oppressed by worldly powers, you know, but in the heavenlies, it was quite the opposite. Victory, victory. And that's why the angels were cheering. Good tidings of great joy. This is why it's so important for us as we enter into this new year, this new season, is to keep our eyes open and pray that God gives us glimpses, glimpses of what's really happening. 
especially in the dark times that we're living in now. So as we move from these 12 days of Christmas and go beyond into what we are experiencing in this day, in these times, it's especially important to keep our spiritual eyes open and perceiving what is really taking place. In the natural, we may seem like we're oppressed, we're being manipulated, we're being tricked, we're deceived, we're persecuted. But in the spirit, what is the spirit saying? What is going on in the spirit world? Well, let me just read from the word. Romans 8.37 says we are more than conquerors. 1 Peter 2.9 says we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. 1 John 4.4 4 says greater is he that is in us than he that is in all the world. This is a new year. We're about to start a study in the new year that's called Soul or the Spirit. And it's based on the book of Ephesians, but it's about how to live and see things through the Spirit when the world tries to keep us bound and deceived to seeing things in the flesh. We'll learn to see things as God sees them, opening our spiritual eyes, not just, not just the eyes of the flesh, that just see the temporal, because that's so easy to get deceived. And we'll meditate on many scriptures and we'll fully embrace seeing things through the Spirit, like it says in Ephesians 1, 18 through 21. I pray, and this is Paul praying, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope which he's called you to, the riches of his glorious inheritance to his holy people and the incomparably great power for us who believe. That's what we need in these days is to understand the incomparably great power for those who believe. So my prayer for you is that you begin to see things this way, now more than ever before. Your, whatever your view is of family or politics or ministry or finances, relationships, your future, or even your health, that you'll see things as God sees them and not looking according to the temporal, the natural, or the flesh. So as the world gets darker and scarier and more and more deceived, Ask God to open the eyes of your heart so that you can see things as God sees them. God bless you.
Thank you for being with us for this online service. And also, thank you for being with us all the way through 2020. It's been a crazy year, a tough year, lots of challenges. But you know what? God has been faithful to you, faithful to you every day of 2020. And that same God will be faithful to you into 2021. As we've learned in this year, we have to keep our eyes on Jesus. And as we've just learned, we have to keep our eyes open to the things of the Spirit. Now, it is getting darker in the natural, but it's get, and in the spiritual, but it's getting lighter in the natural. The days are getting lighter. But even as it gets darker in the spiritual world, remember, as the dark gets darker, the light gets lighter. Stay close to Jesus. If you've never committed your life to him, now's the time for it. Do it before this year ends. Today is the right day for that. Reach out for us and help. let us help you commit your life to Jesus. We love you. We're so glad to journey with you. And we wish you a very happy day. New Year.